part of your tour through the village. The lady here is working with commercial glass beads, a stainless steel needle, and flax thread. In working with this material, she will do two types of bead work. The first is the scroll work which you see on the bench in front of you. It was sewn down the sides of men's pants and along the borders of women's skirts. Second is solid work which she is doing today. It was used in making belts, headbands, and necklaces. As you will see, she will only pick up one bead at a time and sew on to the next. This allows the thread to pass through each bead twice. So that if the belt should break, it would be a clean break, no beads would be lost, and the belt could be easily mended. After the beaded part of the belt was finished, she would take two strips of butt skin and sew them onto the ends to serve as ties. Before the introduction of this material, they would use the teeth, bones, and claws of wild animals, the gray Indian corn bead, also known as Job's Tears, and the seashells were trade items from the coastal tribes. The needle was carved from the straight bone of a deer's leg located just above the hoof, and the thread was made from the dried inner fibers of the Indian hemp plant. It would take her around three to four days to complete a belt, depending on the length and width. Any questions? Were those belts used as money? Huh? Were the belts used as money or trading goods or trade? No, they were just usually used as oh, okay. decorations of the clothing. Your next stop is up the path at the pottery section. Like they were James, don't touch. Good boy. Don't act. Don't touch. This is our pottery section. The lady here is working with native clay found along the riverbanks of this area. In working with this clay, she will do one type of method. It is called a ball method, which is shaped into a ball. By pressing her thumbs through the center, she would give the pot its shape by using her four fingers. After the pot was formed, it was set into the sun to dry until it was firm enough to work with. Then it was brought in and carved to an even thickness by using a metal tool or a seashell. By taking a damp cloth, she would wipe away any scrape marks. Then by using a smooth stone or bone, she would give the pot a shiny finish. For the larger pots, the designs were placed on by using a wooden paddle or a bone with the design already carved into them. For the smaller pots, they would use sticks, seashells, or other small items to make their own designs. After the designs were placed on, they were set into the sun to dry until they turned a chalky white, then they're ready to be burned. A pit was dug and a fire was built. The pots were placed around the edges with the openings towards the flame until they turned a bluish color, then they rolled directly into the fire until the fire would go out. The type of color in our pottery come from the type of wood they were burned with. The light colors come from hard woods that give off more smoke, and the dark colors come from soft woods that give off more flame. Any questions? Your next stop is up the path at the blowgun section. Ooh, blowgun. Oh, this is cool. This is our blowgun section. Our blowguns are made from river cane that is gathered and stored to dry in the manner you see here. After it was dry, it became crooked and needed to be straightened. They would straighten the cane by first holding it over an open fire, then bending it back and forth over their knee. After the cane was straightened, it was cut into the blowgun needed. Then by taking a metal tool like the ones we have here, they would knock out the joints inside the cane. To smooth out the cane, they would use a piece of metal with a piece of rough metal attached to the end. Before the introduction of this material, they would use a long wooden shaft with a piece of flint attached to the end. Here's the dart for the blowgun. The shaft is made from yellow locust and the tail is made from the Scottish thistle, gathered to dry in the manner you see here. After it was dried, they would place a shaft between their thumb and forefinger and use a piece of string and roll it down onto the end of the shaft. Our blowguns were never used in warfare, but for hunting small games such as rabbits and squirrels. The distance the blowgun would shoot would depend upon the length of the blowgun and the person's lung power. Any questions? Roughly how far? 50 feet? 40 to 60 feet. 
Your next stop is down the path at the basket section. And our baskets are made from two different types of materials. The first is river cane, which you saw in the section above. It is gathered and cut into sections and is only scraped on one side because the other side has a smooth and natural finish. Second is white oak, which is gathered and cut into sections by going along the grains that will be cut into splints, which will be scraped on both sides until they are smooth and flexible enough to work with. The type of color in our baskets come from different type of roots and barks which they are boiled with. The black comes from the butternut bark, brown from the walnut bark, yellow from yellow root, and orange from blood root. These were natural dyes and would not fade. There are two types of weaves in making our baskets. The first is a single weave, which is started on bottom, worked up the sides, the handles placed on, and finally the rims. Second is a double weave, which is started on the inside. It is worked up the sides, the splints are bent back, it is worked back down and completed at the bottom. There are two types of handles. The first is the interlocking handle, which is woven into the basket. Second is a drop handle, which is placed on the basket just before the rims in the manner you see here. Before the introduction of this material, they would use hickory bark and a flint knife in making their baskets. Any questions? Your next stop is down the path across the bridge at the arrowhead section. Our arrowhead section. Our arrowheads are made from flint phantom parts of Kentucky and Tennessee that once was the Cherokee Territory. To make an arrowhead, they will first take a large river stone and knock off a smaller piece of flint. By using a smaller stone, they would chip along the edges to give it its more general shape. By using a deer's antler, they would press along the edges to give it its more sharpness and more permanent shape. There are two types of arrowheads. The first is the round shoulder, which was used in hunting, and was attached to the shaft by using the fibers of the Indian hemp plant. When shot into the animal's body, the arrowhead could be withdrawn and reused. Second is a square high shoulder, which was used in warfare, and was attached to the shaft by using animal sinew. When shot into the human's body, the sinew would expand upon mixing with the blood causing the arrowhead to be the left end cut out or pushed on through the body. The shaft is made from mountain cane, which is similar to river cane, but grows smaller and in higher elevations. And the tail is made from the wild turkey. You will now see a demonstration of the blowgun. Watch this girl. <coughs> see, see how shoot this arrow. It's a blow dart. Blow dart. Watch this. See the target? Look at the target. Watch this. Watch this. Wow. Did you see that? That's amazing. Our trap section. The first yeah. trap you see here is the deadfall or bear trap. It was used in catching large game. The bait was placed on the center log. When the bear would come along, they would tug on the bait, releasing the trigger, causing the log in front to fall, breaking the bear's back or pinning him there until the hunter came along. The stockade was built around the trap to prevent the bear from coming in back and stealing the bait. The second trap is the fish trap. This opening was faced downstream. 
when the fish would swim in, they could not come out because of the sharp pointed sticks. They are held together by using hickory bark and buckskin. The fish were released by the hunter when they would come along and use the lid on top to release them only when the fish were needed. The third trap is the figure four or bird trap. It was used in catching smaller game. The bait was scattered in the back. When the animal would come along, they would brush against the sticks in front, causing them to break and causing the animal to be trapped inside. The animal was released by the hunter when they would come along and use the lid on top to release them. Any questions? All right, tell me about this again. What, what, how they This would be face downstream and the okay. fish would swim in and these sticks right here, they would float together, causing the fish to be caught in the back. So they'd swim in there until they need them. Yeah. Your next stop is across the path. This is our corn pounding section. This is the method that our people would use in pounding their corn into cornmeal. They would first boil the corn in hickory ashes, which would act as a lye to remove the outer husk. After the husk was removed, it was rinsed, drained, placed in a mortar and pounded as she is doing now. After she was through pounding the corn, she would place it in a loosely woven basket like the one I have here to be sifted. What would come through the bottom would be used for cornmeal and what was left inside would be used for hominy grits. It would take her around 30 minutes to pound enough cornmeal for the average size family of five or six, and this is for every meal. Any questions? Your next stop is at the path at the first cabin. This is the type of house our people lived in during the 1800s. This was during the Revolutionary War, when many of our houses were destroyed and had to be rebuilt quickly. Notice the logs are not hewn on all sides and the clay was mixed in by using animal fur and straw to prevent it from flaking after drying. Inside there's a loft that extends halfway across the room which was used for storage. A drying rack which was used for preserving fruits and vegetables. And you will also notice iron pots and pans and a woolen blanket that represent trade items from the first settlers. You may take a look inside. Please do not go all the way in. And your next stop is down the path at the next cabin. This was before the war when they had plenty of time to build their homes. Notice the logs are hewn on all sides and a porch has been added on. Inside there's a loft that extends all the way across the room which is used for storage and sleeping quarters for the larger families. The only means our people had for light was the fireplace and the doorway. You will see a smaller scale model of the original Cherokee home later on in your tour. Across the path, you will see a sweat house. Every family owned one, and it was used for storage and sleeping quarters during severe winters. The largest sweat house was found in the center of the village and was owned by the medicine man and was used for a hospital. When a person was sick, he or she was taken into the sweat house and made of one of the benches. Large river stones were in the outside and rolled back into the create a vapor, causing the person to sweat out his or her sickness. Our people had a cure for every sickness and disease until the introduction of smallpox just wiped out half of our population. You may take a look inside both of these and your next stop is across the path at the finger wigging section. Stop.
gonna do, right? Build houses. This is our finger weaving section. The ladies here are working with commercial yarn. In working with this yarn, they will do two types of weaves. The first is a single weave, which is an over and under method and will give you plaid and check designs. Second is a double weave, which is similar to working on a loom, but no looms were used and will give you a more variety of designs. The ladies here could work with 10 to 200 strands at one time. When one was complete, they were made to be belts or sashes or were sewn Yay. together to make blankets or shawls. Before the introduction of this material, they would use the inner fibers of the Indian hemp plant or the fibers of the mulberry root bark which is also dyed in the same dyes you saw in the basket section. It would take them around three to four days to complete a belt, depending on the length and width. Any questions? Where would they get the blue color from? Well, all the, so many colors in blues. Back in the old days. Yeah, it back, they just had the color dyes that you saw in the basket section. So they, they didn't have anything different though. This is from Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, how did, how did you ladies learn to do this art? From each other. From passed down. Daddy! If you will notice the house above, this is the type of house DeSoto found our people living in during the 1540s. As you see, our people never did live in teepees or wigwams. We were a farming tribe and did not have to follow the herd of animals for our food. The house was constructed by placing large poles in the ground and covering them with saplings, the saplings with mats, and the mats with red clay. The mat beside the doorway is not a window. It is only there to show you how the house is constructed. The roof is made of thatch, which is raised in the center to let the smoke escape because our fires were always built in the center of the room. You may take a look inside and your next stop is down the path of the canoe section. Get that spider web. I'll see it. So good there, though. I don't see it. Is it from the 1500s? Yeah, she said they never lived. They did. 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 That's me. Is it? Yeah. H&R canoes are made from yellow poplar, which you also might know as the tulip tree. Before the introduction of metal, our people would use the burning method. They would pack gray clay along the base of the tree and start a small fire. The clay would control the fire to burn through the tree instead of up. When the tree was down, the bark was stripped off and red clay was packed on top and small fires were started. After the fire would go out, they would use a stone axe to chip away the charcoal. They would do this method repeatedly till they have reached their desired hole. Yeah. Then by placing animal fat or pine resin over the canoe, it would make them waterproof. The original canoe was 30 to 40 feet long, two to three feet wide, and could hold 10 to 12 men in a standing or kneeling position. To maneuver their canoes, they would use the poling method, which would reach the river banks and river bottoms. Our canoes were village owned and would last indefinitely. They were never used in warfare, but for transportation and fishing only. Using the burning method, it would take six to eight months and metal tools two to three weeks. Any questions? How long did it take them to build one of these? 
using the burning method six to eight months and metal tools two to three weeks. Look at this. All right, now you said they don't use these during warfare, and then you said that the blow darts weren't used during warfare. What did they use during warfare? Just the arrows. Just the arrows. No hatchets? They, do they use hatchets it? and arrows? Yeah. That's a fireplace. No, yes. It's a kind of fireplace. Right now, it's a fireplace. <laughs> Your next stop is up the path at the wood carving section. carving section our bows were made from yellow locust which is a strong and flexible wood and the string was made from the braided inner fibers of the Indian hemp plant. Our mask and dough bowls were made from soft wood such as buckeye and cucumber. The masks will be explained more to you about on the square grounds. Our rattles were used for ceremonial items and will be explained more to you about on the square grounds. This one is made from the gourd and the other from white pine. Before the introduction of metal, our hoe was made from a large piece of flint which was attached to a piece of rhododendron. The pipe was made from pipe stone which was easy to carve with with a knife. This one represents the seven clans of the Cherokee people which will be explained more to you about in the council house. The crossbow drill was used for drilling holes and what they needed them for. They would use different sized pieces of flint and the wooden wheel would have been made from stone to serve as weight. The seashells were trade items from the coastal tribes. The sharper edges were knocked off and used for the decoration of men and women's clothing. What was left was burned, crushed, and ground into a powder, which was later used for whitewash for ceremonial items. Any questions? Your next stop is at the path at the storage house. This is the storage house. It was village owned and every community owned one. It was used for storaging access grain, animal fur, and pottery. This will complete my tour with you. I've enjoyed having you as a group. You may take a look inside when you are finished. If you will have a seat over here at the square grounds, your next guide will be with you shortly. Thank, Thank you. you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you here to our village, and I hope that you have enjoyed your tour so far. On this part of the tour, I will be your guide. My name is Buck the Squirrel. The area which you are now seated, this was called the square grounds or the ceremonial grounds. This is where all the ceremonial dances would have taken place. Inside the square mound of sand, you see built up around it. Every village had a square ground, and it was located as close to the center of the village as possible. Now, the reason that we use this sand because our villages were never built on a hillside in a wooded area like you are in today. They would have been built down in the valleys next to the rivers. The reason for that is because the Cherokee people were farmers and this sand would have been readily available. The size of this square depended upon the size of the village. Now the smaller Cherokee villages 
They had anywhere from 10 up to 15 families. Some of their square grounds could have been built a little bit larger than the one you see here today. Now the larger villages, they had anywhere from 300 up to 500 families. Some of their square grounds, they could have covered up an area about the size of a football field. Now on this mound, the four corners will point to the four corners of the earth. The pole that you see in the center that has the pine branches fastened to it, the original one would have not been built no larger than the one you see here today. And it was used only to shade the drummers. All the dances that were held here, they were all held on the inside of this mound. They were never held on the outside. The outside was considered to have been common ground, and the inside was considered to have been sacred ground. Anyone was welcome to take part, women and children. If you wanted to take part in these dances, you had to be on the inside of the mound before the dances would have started. The dances were called prayer dances. That's because Cherokees, they didn't worship any gods, any idols, or anything of nature. We've always believed in one supreme being, and that being the Creator. Now, when you're sitting at today, this is where you would have sat when you weren't taking part. Notice that it's sectioned off into seven different sections. That represents the seven clans of the Cherokee. Now, a little bit later, right down here in the council house, you're going to learn more about the Cherokee clan system. Each clan had their own section to set in. No other clan set inside another clan's area. Let's say the dances would have already started. You may have came to the ceremonies late, or you were setting where you're setting at right now, but you decided, well, I'm going to take part. So you went ahead and you stepped inside this mound. Now, if you got caught stepping inside, some of the men, they would have came and taken you to a post that was put at each corner. They tied you to the post, and you were left there until the remainder of the dances. Some of the dances lasted a day. Some of them lasted up to seven days. And during this time, you were tied to the post. Also, you were not given any food nor water. Cherokees were very strict people, and they believed in hard discipline. And when our people done these dances, they didn't do them for entertainment or pleasure. They were done for ceremonial reasons only. And you never seen any type of fast dancing or fancy dancing like you see at a powwow. All of our dances were done at a slow pace in a circular motion. They did take breaks in the dances. You could step out during the break and you were allowed to come back. If you stepped out before the break, you were not allowed back inside this mound. They used different types of instruments to bring rhythm to the dances. We have a few here today. We're going to show to you, explain to you how they were made and used. I'll explain about the ceremonial mask, about the eagle dance, Cherokee alphabet, and the Cherokee language. I'll even talk to you in the Cherokee language. That'll give you folks an idea of what our language sounds like when it is spoken. And I'll tell you about how most of our people worship today. Now the first two that I have here, they're called ceremonial hand rattles. This one right here is called the gourd rattle. Now these gourds, they raised them in the gardens. They weren't good for eating, but they did use them to make bird houses, water dippers, and like the rattle you see here. To make this rattle, you take the seeds out of the gourd and dry it out and replace them by using small kernels of corn or small stones and place a stick through the center. This one right here, that's called a turtle rattle. That's made by using a woodland terrapin shell. That's commonly known as a box turtle. To make this rattle, you cut the turtle out of the shell, then you dry it out, and you replace it by using the small kernels of corn or small stones and place a stick through the shell. Now, when our people use these types of hand rattles, this may have been a type of sound they would have gotten. Another type our people made and used, and this right here is called the leg rattle. Now this also was made by using the terrapin shells, and they were attached to a large piece of oak skin. Some of these leg rattles could have as many as seven rattles attached to it. The reason is because the number seven, that was a sacred number to the Cherokee people. Now the one that wore this would have been the lady dancers. The Cherokee were one of the few tribes that allowed their women to take part. And the lady that wore this, <clears throat> she danced directly behind the lead dancer. It was tied right below the knee and right above the ankle. To get sound and rhythm from a leg rattle, they would have used their feet. It may have sounded something like this.
Now before the introduction of metal tools and knives, when our people made their drums, they made them out of clay, like you seen up in the pottery section. They would have attached some type of animal skin across the top. After the introduction of metal tools and knives, our people began making drums like the one you see right here. This right here is called a water drum. It's carved out by using buckeye wood. It's hollowed out down to about one or two inches from the bottom. The skin stretched across the top would have came from a ground hog. The reason they used the ground hog is because it was one of the toughest skins that was found in this area. Now the skin was held on by using a removable hickory band. The different tones that you got from this drum, that depended upon the amount of water that you placed on the inside. Another type our people made to use, this right here is called a single tone. That's commonly known as a tom-tom. This drum also is carved out by using buckeye wood. But this drum's hollowed out all the way through. The skin also would have came from groundhog. Now some earlier drums that were made and used, some of them, they could have been as twice as large as the one you see right here. When they use this type of drum, this may have been a type of sound they would have got. And when our people done these dances, we always had a lead dancer. Most of the time, that lead dancer was a man. Sometimes it may have been a woman. Now this woman, she had to be an elder in the village. And when they led the dances, the lead dancer would wear some type of mask to show what type of dance was being done. Before the introduction of metal tools and knives, the masks were made out of tree bark. They carved them out by using a flint knife. To show what type of dance was being done, they would have attached some type of animal hair or by using whitewash that was gotten from crushed seashells. After the introduction of metal tools and knives, our people began making masks like the one you see right here. Now if the lead dancer wore masks like this one, they could have been doing what they called a hunt dance or the bear dance. The night before that the men planned to go on a hunting trip, they'd all gather here at the square grounds and they'd have a prayer dance to ask the Supreme One for a safe and successful trip. Now upon the return, everything went well, they all gathered back here to give thanks for a safe and successful trip. Now, some of you folks, you may have already went downtown or passed through town. You may have seen some gentlemen standing out here in front of these craft shops wearing all these brightly colored feathers. Now, these gentlemen, they are Cherokee, but the regalia they wear, that's not of the Cherokee people. Cherokees did not wear a lot of feathers. That's more of your Western or your Plains Indians. Our chief, he did wear feathers, but he wore the feathers only for ceremonies. There was a dance our people did that feathers were used. The dance was called the Eagle Dance. And this dance was done in three parts, for victory, for peace, and to give thanks to the eagle for the use of its feathers. Now these wands, the handles, were carved out by using sour wood. Sour wood was a sacred wood to the Cherokees because it blooms seven times in one season. The feathers came from a golden eagle. The golden eagle is a sacred bird to the Cherokee people. Not only to the Cherokees, but other Indian tribes as well. Only the men were allowed to take part in this dance. When they done the dance, they held the wands out at arm's length to show representation of the eagle in flight. Cherokees were very superstitious. They believed that if any part of these wands touched the ground or touched this mound in any way, they believed that the man carrying these wands or someone in his family would soon die. Now I want to tell you about the Cherokee alphabet. The Cherokee alphabet was written and invented by a man by the name of George Gist. His Cherokee name was Sequoia. Now he was born over near a place called Fort Loudon, Tennessee. Spent most of his earlier life in northern Alabama. When he was trying to create this alphabet, there were two major failures before he was successful. The first one, he tried to create a character and a symbol with every word, but there were far too many words. On the second one, he tried to create a character with every sentence. He found too many ways of creating a sentence. Now upon his third and final, 
he'd sit and he'd listen to our people speak the language. Then by hearing the sounds of the language, he was able to complete the alphabet using 85 different symbols. It took him 12 years to complete it. During this time, Sequoia could not read, write, nor speak any other language but Cherokee. Today, a lot of these historians, they claim Sequoia to have been at an illiterate genius. Thanks to Sequoia and other men, we had our own newspaper. The paper was called the Cherokee Phoenix, printed down in a place called New Echota, Georgia. New Echota, that's the last known capital of the Cherokee Nation. The paper was printed once a month, printed in Cherokee and in English. Now, the reason they printed it in English was so the settlers could also read the paper. At one time, they thought that the Cherokee language was dying out. This was due to intermarriages or just a lack of interest upon our part. It mainly had to do with a lot of lack of pride. A long time ago, they came and took the young Cherokee children and they put them in boarding schools. Now, in these boarding schools, they were not allowed to speak the Cherokee language. They forced them to learn how to speak English. If they were ever caught speaking the Cherokee language, they were severely punished. That's why when a lot of these people grew up and had children, a lot of them wouldn't teach their kids to speak Cherokee. They were afraid to because what happened to them, they thought might also happen to their children for speaking their own native tongue. Today, here on the reservation, in the school systems, starting in daycare, we teach the little children how to speak Cherokee. In elementary, grades K through six, it's taught as an introductory course. In high school, it's taught as any other foreign language taught inside a public school. It's taught along with Cherokee history. These are two mandatory classes. You must take them and you must pass before they allow you to graduate from high school. Shio, y'all doesn't. I uncle again, shalo lee. Hello, how are you? I'm Buck Squirrel. All stun, shono lee, y'all doesn't. All seek was on. Enoch. Good morning, how are you? I'm doing fine. I love you, I want coffee and hurry up. Ama, aqua dooley, huh? Ama is water. Aqua dooley, huh? I want, I want water. Ski, thank you. Wadum, you're welcome. Kaji used, who are you? He list dun, can Hurry up, come over here. Shagwa, Kali, Joy, Nunk. Hishkin, that's counting to five. A few animals, bear is Yona. Cat, Weshunk. Dog, Geek Lee. Groundhog, All Gun. Rabbit, G Stu. Horse, Shogwa Lee. Well, that's an example of what the language sounds like when it's spoken. <coughs> the dances, they are still used today by some people on the reservation. The reason why a lot of our people don't use them anymore is because we were introduced to Christianity and this was through the white missionaries. Now back then, a lot of our people were easily converted into Christians, began attending churches, and began using this verbal form of prayer, so we no longer needed to use the prayer dances. Today, here on the reservation in some churches, you can find song books that are printed in Cherokee and in English. The largest known translation today is the entire New Testament of the Bible, translated from the good old King James Version by a Cherokee preacher by the name of David Brown in 1832. Thanks to Sequoia and his writings, the teachings in the schools, the language will never die out. There's two things that cannot be done in the Cherokee language. One, you cannot curse at anyone because there's no curse words in our language. Two, you can't tell anyone goodbye. There's no words for goodbye. Our people have always believed we'd see one another again, if not the next day, later on. A day the dog wouldn't uh huh, sure no lay. A day the dog wouldn't uh huh. Until we meet again, sure no lay, meaning in the morning or tomorrow. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this will complete my part of your tour. Is there anyone, anyone here that's already been to the council house yet? Have you been to the council house? Anybody? Okay. Uh, the council house is going to be your next stop. <clears throat> now, I'll tell you, uh, after you finish the council house, that will complete your whole tour through the village. But you are more than welcome to walk back through, take more pictures, talk to the workers. There's also the Indian Gardens. The entrance is located right beside the ticket office. That's about a 15-minute walk. That's something that you do on your own, no additional cost. <clears throat> now, to get to the council house, you can take these steps or the pathway down the hill to the building down here on the left. Just go inside, find a seat. Next guide, she will be with you in just a couple minutes. I do want to thank you folks for your attention. I
hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. I hope you have a safe one. God bless you. Thank you very much. Every Cherokee Village had a council house which was located on the west side of the square ground. It was built as close to the center of the village as possible. The door faced to the east and was constructed as a winding corridor so that the inside was never seen from the outside. The size of the council house depended upon the size of the village. Villages ranged in size from small villages of a dozen homes up to towns with two to five hundred homes. The council house was always built large enough to accommodate every member of the village, including the children. As you'll notice, the council house has seven sides, and on the inside there are seven sections of seats. During meetings and ceremonies, each clan sat in their own designated section. At one time, our people lived under a clan system. We do not know how it originated or why the women were heads of the clans. The names of the clans were the bird, deer, wolf, paint, blue, long hair, and wild potato. Each clan was considered one large family and was not allowed to marry among themselves. If a person wanted to get married, he had to pick his mate from one of the other six clans. After marrying, the man would leave his clan, join his wife's clan, and the children inherited their clanship from their mother. Through the years, our clan system has been lost, but today some of us can trace back to find out which clan we belong to. The fireplace in the center of the room is where a fire was kept burning year-round. It was rekindled once a year in late October or early November. At the same time that the fire in the council house was being relit, all the women in the village would put out the fires in their homes, clean out their fireplaces, and then come to the doorway of the council house to get new fire to take back home. This signified the beginning of a new year. The design around the fireplace contained seven different types of wood. Each clan had their own wood, which they used to feed the fire throughout the year. There were men who were assigned to the council house, whose only duty was to make sure that the fire never went out. The masks on the post were used for ceremonial dances. They were worn by the lead dancer. They were used in the snake dance, the bear dance, and the buffalo dance. Some of the masks were worn by women, who were also allowed to take part in the dances. This is something that very few other tribes allowed. The eagle wands that you see at the top were used for our eagle dance. If you haven't been to the square ground, this dance will be explained there. The white bowl and the white gourd dippers were used for our purification ceremony. Our people believe that by drinking herbal teas from these vessels that they could purify their minds. Each clan had their own dipper, and the member of one clan was not allowed to drink from the dipper of another. The Hudson Bay blankets here in the back represent trade items from the settlers. The headdresses and outfits are all copies of the originals. The white headdress and outfit were worn by the peace chief. His headdress was made from the tail feathers and the down of the white herring. We had to trade with the coastal tribes in order to get these feathers. His cape was made from the breast feathers of the wild turkey. The peace chief was in charge of religious ceremonies, marriage ceremonies, and civil council meetings. He had a right-hand man and a principal speaker, and during meetings and ceremonies, they occupied the three white seats. He also had a council of seven members, one from each clan. The peace chief wore white because white is the symbol of peace. Whenever a village was threatened by war, the peace chief would have to step down and let the war chief have complete authority over the village. The red headdress, outfit, shields, and weapons belonged to the war chief. His cape was made from the tail and wing feathers of the wild turkey and is trimmed in red because red is the symbol of war. The war chief was elected to his position by the warriors in the village. He had a right-hand man, a principal speaker, and a war council of seven members, one from each clan. When a man was made war chief, he had to take an oath never to go to war without just cause, nor shed the blood of infants, women, old men, or anyone who could not defend themselves. He was known as Kalanu, or the Raven. Every Cherokee village had a council house, a square ground, seven clans and two chiefs, a peace chief and a war chief. Over the entire Cherokee nation was a third chief known as the principal chief. Wherever his home was located was considered the capital of the Cherokee nation. The last established capital was in New Echota, Georgia in 1838. This was during the time of the removal. The principal chief at that time was John Ross, who was one-eighth Cherokee. 
The principal chief was known for his wisdom and ability as a leader. The skirt you see here on the end was worn by the beloved woman. It was made from the breast feathers of the wild turkey and trimmed with the down from the heron. The beloved woman was the widow of a chief or an elderly woman who was well known and highly respected. She was allowed to sit in on all council meetings and she had a vote in deciding whether or not the village went to war. It was the beloved woman and her council who decided whether or not the prisoners taken in were put to death or adopted into a clan as members of the tribe. She had a council of seven members, one from each clan, and they were all elderly women. They were known as the beloved women or the war women. Women were allowed in the council house for religious ceremonies, marriage ceremonies, and war council meetings. The peace chief's wife attended most civil meetings. This was because if he was to die with no successor, she would have to sit in his place until another chief was chosen. The yellow headdress and outfit were worn by the peace chief during his initiation ceremony. When a peace chief died, his position never passed from father to son as it did in most tribes. Instead, his position went to his oldest sister's oldest son. This was to keep it in the same clan for as long as possible. If the sister had no son, then the right-hand man and the counselors of the dead chief would decide who the next chief would be. The cape here on the end was made from fox hide and was worn by scouts during times of war. The scouts would warn the village if an enemy was anywhere in the area by making the sound of a bird or an animal which they represented. In 1838, the federal government forced our people to leave their homes here in the east and move to the west. This is known to us and in history as the removal or the Trail of Tears. 17,000 people started on this journey and almost 5,000 of them died due to the lack of food, clothing, shelter, and mistreatment from the soldiers. Today, our population is about 13,000. The people living here are the descendants of those who refused to leave their homes and fled to the mountains to hide. We are known as the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. The descendants of those that went on the removal live in Oklahoma. They're known as the Western Cherokee, and they are considered a completely separate tribe from us today. Their population is much larger than ours. At one time, our people owned what are parts of today eight states. They are the two Carolinas, the two Virginias, Georgia, Kentucky, Alabama, and Tennessee. Today, our land covers 56,573 acres and is scattered over four counties. It is known to us as the Paula Boundary. This land had to be purchased back from the state of North Carolina, and this was done with the help of Will Thomas, who was the white adopted son of Drowning Bear. In 1924, we became citizens of the United States, and at that time, placed our land in trust with the federal government. This means that we are not allowed to sell our land to any outsiders. We may buy and sell the land among ourselves, and outsiders may lease the land for up to 25 years at a time. When the missionaries came and brought their Bibles, they found that the Cherokees believed in only one supreme being. Because of this belief, we were easily converted to Christianity. Today, the predominant religion is the Southern Missionary Baptist, but we do have churches of other denominations. Today, we have a chief and a vice chief that are elected every four years. We also have a tribal council of 12 members, two from each of the six townships. They're elected every two years. They handle all tribal business, and they function in the same manner as a mayor and city council. <clears throat> Today, we do pay federal income taxes, but we don't pay state or property taxes because our land is held in trust with the federal government. As you came through our village today, we tried to show you how our people lived, worked, and dressed over 200 years ago. Today, we live in modern homes, and our daily lives are no different than anyone else's. This will complete my part of your tour. If you haven't been to the square ground, this will be your next stop. Just follow this path right here and have a seat under one of the shelters. Your next guide will be with you in a few minutes. If you've already been to the square ground, this will complete your tour through our village, but you're welcome to stay as long as you like. If you're leaving, just follow the exit signs and it'll lead you out to the parking lot. Thanks for your attention and have a nice day. Thank you.
boy of mine wants to be a one stick, that might be all he gets. News that the Cherokees made them always came from yellow poplar. It's also known as the tulip tree. The Cherokees never made any birds by packing the red clay mud about three or four feet off the ground around the base of a tree to start fires around it. The red clay's natural dampness will control the fire, keep it from burning. Did you notice my clean yard? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I will up here. I it this morning. I got it swept the bridge off. I will up here. Yeah. Yeah, I cleaned off that big mess way over there in the corner. Mm -hmm. Where it all accumulates, you know, where the water pumps up. Look at that. Non skid stuff they put down. It's start to come up over in that one corner. Mm -hmm.